well as a, a teacher and, and coach. And so I do a lot of training. I'm an author of the book, The Journey of Living Day by Day. And so I'm just trying to maximize my full potential, do everything that I can while I can. And Amen. so that's just a little bit about me. Amen. And I believe uh, your father is the pastor of the church. Yes, my father's the senior pastor of the church. I serve there as the youth pastor. And uh, he's, we, the church is uh, going into its 26th year. Wow. And um, I, it's growing leaps and bounds. God has really just been blessing us and showing us favor. And so I'm honored to be able to serve with him. I get to see a different vantage point uh, with my father being the pastor. I get to wow. see kind of up close and personal ministry, all the goods, the bad and the indifferent. <laughs> and so <laughs> uh, it's been a, a, a fun journey, a rewarding journey, and I've learned a lot. Amen. Amen. Uh, we all know some that may not know, some that do know. Another friend of mine, Pastor Brown from the Parkersburg area. He's another PK kid and um, he's been in ministry for quite some time. I believe 25, 26 years at the current location he's at as well. And, um, you know, Pastor Brown, would you like to say or share something that you didn't share last time um, about your ministry or you could even, even shadow what you did uh, last time? So, um, that way people at least get a feel that's new watching you. Yes, sir. Blessings to you, my brothers. Yes, sir. Uh, Blessings. You know, we, we, we are <clears throat> located in the great city, I-49 North Town Road, in the great city of Parkersburg, West Virginia. And uh, we, we've been working there for a while. And the Lord is blessing us. Uh, he's allowed us to even grow during the pandemic. Amen. So anybody that's in the area, you're looking, come on over and worship the Lord with us. We'll be glad to have you. Amen. Amen. These are great two ministries. If you're in the Charlotte area, please look them up. Um, you can find all information at both the um, web pages as well. Pastor Brown, is it the great city dot org or is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Web Okay, Elder Green, what would be your website for those that would want to look you up? Uh, for the church, it's PDT, as in Prayer Deliverance Tabernacle Ministries.org. And for myself, it's just my name, Roger Green, like the color, JR as in junior.com, Roger Green Junior.com. All right. Um, let's kind of kick this off um, with this. Um, we, we are preachers' kids. We know that. We know we've come up. In the trenches of ministry, we've watched our fathers, we've watched our mothers. We, we've a lot of a lot of us has grown up in, in, in preaching families or come from a rich inheritance of, 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 of preachers um, or ministry rather. Um, let's go here for the ones wanting to start. They have a calling on their life. They know what they are chosen to do, and where do they start? They know they have a calling. They know they have a Bible. Um, they know they have a good home church when they attend, right? We understand pandemics and stuff, but where do they where do they begin from a Bible point of view, and where do they begin from a ministry point of view? Either one can start first. Um, I'd say it, it without sounding too churchy or cliche. It, it has to start in prayer. Uh, the Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things are be, should be added unto you. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. There's so many other scriptures. So it starts, uh, the substratum, the base of it starts with prayer. It starts seeking God's face. Uh, it, when you want to get into ministry, ministry means nothing more than service. Uh, that's what the word in its original context means. So often when we say we want to minister, we have to qualify that within our own personal perception of what ministry is and also what is God intending for me to do in ministry. It doesn't just mean to preach. And so often when people feel like there's a calling on their life that they need to minister, they immediately think preach. And, and that, that's not always the case. You know, some of us have different callings that are much more profound than the pulpit. And so I would say pray, number one, carve out a space of time, not just in ordinary prayer, but just carving out a space of time for prayer and for fasting and to say, okay, specifically during this period of time, I'm going to do nothing more than seek God for this. Mm. And, but this is the caveat, be prepared 
to maybe not even get an answer right then. But it's just the sacrifice of asking God, seeking God's face. And then thirdly, I would say, get some wise counsel. I find a lot of times people can be deep. They have no problem when you say you need to pray. They have no problem when they say, read your Bible, seek God's face. But they have problems when you when they say, uh, find some counsel, find someone that has been there, done that, that can give you wise counsel that can help you. You know, I think often when we speak of counsel, people, you know, they automatically think, you know, if God's talking to me, why I got to hear from somebody else, you know, but God puts human agents on this earth to kind of guide us and steer us and give us good godly wisdom. And so I, I would admonish, especially if you're going into the preach ministry to find some type of mentor that can kind of show you some direction, because, you know, when we all start, we have this abundance of zeal. Uh, but not necessarily a lot, a lot of wisdom and knowledge. And so sometimes you need somebody to help you harness all of that excitement into the right direction. Now, before I pass, before I ask uh, uh, Elder Brown the same thing, Pastor Brown, uh, where do they start in the Bible? Some say Psalms, some say Proverbs. Where do they begin? Well, I, I, I'm a student of the word, and, I, and I, I like to start from the very beginning. And what I mean by that, uh, start from Genesis and, and work your way throughout the entire Bible. You know, I think you can find Jesus from Genesis to Revelation. And so get a strong foundation of the word, understand context, understand who he's talking to and find those things. So start uh, from from what I like to find is a categorized view of the Bible. You know, look at the first five books, the law, then go to the books of history then go to the books of poetry, then go to the books of prophecy, and then go to the New Testament, look at the gospels, but, and then look at the, the history, which is Acts, then look at the letters, then the book of prophecy, Revelation, especially the New Testament, it gives you a great insight because the gospels will lead you to salvation, the book of Acts will teach you about salvation, and then the letters will teach you how to live saved once you've gotten saved, and then Revelation will give you your expectation that you'll get if you live saved or if you don't live saved. And so understanding that aspect of the Bible will begin to guide you, be, be able to find not only God in the Bible, but begin to find yourself in those scriptures. And so th there is no magical formula. Just dive in from the beginning and work your way through taking proper notes, praying to God for revelation and if I can say this to someone, and this is not even a shameless plug to my book. My book is called The Journey of Living Day by Day. Mm. And the reason why that's so important to me, because early on, I, I experienced a lot of success young. You know, mm. I started my first business around 2021. 20, you know, I was making six figures, you know, early on in my 20s and, and wow. very, very successful preaching and teaching the word of God all over the country. And so I thought life was a sprint. And so I had a few roadblocks with health and with setbacks and different things. And I realized life was not a sprint. Ministry was not a sprint. I couldn't accomplish it overnight. I had to accomplish it while going through my night. And All so right. if I can tell anyone that today, it's really a journey. Stop trying to fast track ministry. Stop trying to get past people that have been doing it for several years. You know, if God wants to accelerate you, he can. Trust me, he can do it just like that. But don't cheat the process. Do not cheat the process. And that's what I would tell someone. That's good. Very good. Uh, several nuggets that we could just stop and just talk about. But <laughs> Pastor Brown, which we'll come back to. Pastor Brown, what would you say uh, those that, again, know they have a calling, but just starting, and then from a biblical approach? Yes, sir. Uh, Elder Green said it so well. Actually, taking some of my words, um, <laughs> he almost said it so well and so thoroughly that I really don't need to respond. No, uh, sir, we want to hear your perspective. <laughs> <laughs> Nonetheless, I, I would start again, as, as he said, certainly with prayer, and let's let's really unpack prayer, you know, and, and let's really understand you know, the volume of prayer and for exactly what it is. We need to pray in praying capacities and we need to stop talking so much. Mm. Uh, and we need to pray as in we're seeking God. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm here 
and I need a word from you. I I, I literally need to. I, I literally need to have you in my presence. I need your guidance. Mm. And we have to learn that after we seek the Lord, you know, after we approach the throne of grace, we need to know how to digress and allow God to speak to us. You know, there's 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 absolutely positively way too much talking in prayer. Um, you know, God God's not impressed with praying per se. He's not in, he's not impressed with our words. Um, what, what God relishes is our relationship. When we understand God, I need you. That's good. You know, you're you're all the world to me. Now, now you're talking. Mm. And so we need to get in those places where we understand what this prayer is about. And and it's never to impress, because you can't impress God no way. That's right. You, That's that you're gonna, you ain't never gonna stumble up on nothing that you can impress God with. And and so you know, we, we need to. We need to unpack prayer and, and make sure that, you know, I'm praying. You know, God, I'm seeking you. Yeah. Right. And so you call, call me. So since you call me, speak to me. If you speak to me, I'll hear. And if you show me, I'll walk in your way. Now, if you start there, I, I can't see you going wrong uh, seeking God in those capacities because, you know, we, you, there's, there's no way you can go wrong seeking God, period. That's right. And so when we learn how to open up and understand and seek God wholeheartedly, then we'll, we'll be on the right path. And the second thing I would say is, let's learn to smile. Let's, let's learn to smile. You know, it's, it's, listen, y'all, it's, it's such an impactful part of ministry that, you know, we just, I don't know what we do sometimes. I mean, I know, I know we go through and I know we're inundated. I know, you know, we have trials, tribulations. I know we have challenges, you know, folk acting crazy on your nerves. But we've got to get back. See, there's small things that God does for us. There are things that God does for us that, that just come with walking with him. If we would utilize those things, you know, God begins to burden life. He's not, he's, God's not going to put more on us than we're able to bear. He's not going through stuff. And God just gonna drown you out. And make you, I can't make it, and you die. And no, that's no. That's let's right. how to smile. Let, let somebody know that you know you're you're entreating them. That that you paused, you know, to address them. You actually, you know, how are you doing? You know, let's greet some folks. Let's smile. Let's 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 you know fall in love with Jesus, so He can teach us how to love ourselves. See, when you love yourself, when you in love with Jesus, and you love yourself. The other stuff just comes, it just flows, man. It, it flows. So that's that's where I start. So. And would, would you would you agree with Elder Green with starting from Genesis to Revelation? Or do you see a different point of view? Well, I have no problem with that at, at all. Um, I, I would say that would be perfectly fine. Usually when when an individual asks me, uh, I usually do suggest the song and the problem. Um just because they they are they're, they're like an introductory to uh, places where you can relate to God, you know, the concepts and praise and you know, uh, you know, places. It, it really teaches you how to approach the throne of grace, you know. And I don't want to get too deep in that, but we've lost some things. We've lost some things. Transitioning from generation to generation, uh, decades. We've lost some things. We've got to go back to the place where we really understand how to appreciate God uh, at a point of reference because he is God. You know, we came here to worship him. And so we've got to get back to those places. I think if we get back to those places where we understand who God is, there's some things that God wants to release in our lives, uh, like immediately. And uh, I, I love both points of views because uh, nothing's wrong, right? And and this is what I want you all out here in the audience to see. Take a second, we'll take another second to pause. Those who's come in, share this, share this, share this. This is information that we all are learning. We all need to hear, we all need to be this sponge. So what we are, the ones that are coming in, what we're talking about is uh, your walk with now. Y'all both have said so many gold nuggets that we tend to get 
very religious, whether it's, den whether it's denominational, whether it's scriptural, so much so that we become spiritual butchers. Hmm. We become spiritual, uh, 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 what you call them, uh, morticians, right? Hmm. That we cut people apart so much, but we never want them to be totally spiritually renewed, sutured, right? We never want to get the poison out because there's a lot of folks, let's flip this conversation. We have a lot of people that's been in church, know the word, but they have been butchered along the way. They've been hurt along the way by this here, right? By this right here. They've been butchered because a lot of us has not studied to show ourselves approved. This is why I wanted to go here because we say we love the Lord, but we don't pick up not a near this. A lot of folk, they go to church every Sunday. Can't tell you what the preacher preached on. Can't tell you the topic. Can't tell you the scripture. Don't know scripture for themselves, but they, 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 they use scripture enough. So, well, you shouldn't judge, but it also says judge with the amount of weight. So we stop conveniently at almost like let's chop and cut the scriptures to, to suit us. So the reason why I kind of started with this, this, this question or this point of view here is because whether you start from Genesis, whether you start from Proverbs, whether you start from Revelation and go back, are you living it? Right. Are you living? What, what I remember being seven years old getting saved around that time and the relationship that I had with the Lord, no one had to tell me y'all to read my Bible. No one had to tell me to study. No one had to tell me to pray. That's the relationship that I personally had with the Lord. Now, when you are as of a child, the relationship I believe is more pure because you have a sincerity of heart that no one has yet shook you or deterred you yet, right? So when you get to the age of accountability and you get to the age of, I know everything now, I got a little bit of word in me. And y'all both said something a little earlier about take the time to get to know the Lord. Elder Green said it, you're so, and Pastor Brown said, so busy talking. I say this all the time. So busy talking that we never hear what the Lord says. Right. You got these people that, that talk all the time, talk, 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 but you can't get a word in edgewise. This is how the Lord is. So eventually the Lord does this. I'm going to let y'all, I'm going to let you do your own thing. I'm going to let you do your own thing because when you get finished talking, maybe I can have a little bit of time. So this transitions into what we're saying tonight is not who's right or wrong. Open the Bible and read it. This is what we're saying tonight. Open it. It's, it's here. Yes, we know we have 66 books. Yes, we know we have more books of the Bible. Yes, we know that. But at the end of the day, can we at least open it and read it and take God at his word now? Let's, let's transition into this. Um, Dr. Shelton, can I add to that? Absolutely. I, I think in, in the discipline of theology as we know it, and theology for those out there is nothing more than the study of God. And I don't think that you can be a responsible Christian without studying God, studying who he is, studying his attributes, so that we can mirror his behavior, mirror his attributes. And so in the discipline of theology, as we study God, we study his essence, study who he is, there are two things. There's a responsible side that we call exergy, and then there's an irresponsible side that we call eisergesis. Mm -hmm. And so exergesis is taking what the text says for it, what it says and lifting what it says and getting a learning and an understanding and revelation. Then there is eisegesis, which is putting meaning in the text. Mm -hmm. And so often in our generation, we have a whole lot of eisegesis, putting meaning in the text based on our personal pet peeves, based on our culture, based on our experiences, based on our likes and dislikes, and not based upon what the text is actually saying. And so what we need to do is put down our own mentality, our own vices, our own thinking, our own cultures, and try to figure out what is the scripture saying and looking at context, taking it line upon line, precept upon precept, and looking at the understanding of the evolution of revelation that God gave. And that's why I say from Genesis to Revelation, 
because if you see at this, the revelation that he gives to the patriarchs is a whole lot different than the revelation that he's given to his, his apostles. That's right. He begins to unveil, reveal and unveil things over time. And so he didn't throw out the whole kitchen caboodle in Genesis to him. <laughs> That's right. That's he began right. to unravel it over time. And so that by the time he got to the apostles, he began to reference things that he taught back in the Old Testament. Remember when I taught you this? Okay, now this is review. Now I'm catching you up to speed. And I was, Jesus was God concealed in the Old Testament. But now in the New Testament, I'm going to start revealing some things. And so I say that to the saints that, you know, we can't just use the word and butcher it, number one. We can't use the word to cut people up, to kill them. Listen, a knife can be used as an instrument of war or it can be used as an instrument of medicine. And so often the scripture, that two-edged sword, can be used to kill people or can be used to surgically with precision use it to heal and begin to, as you mentioned, suture them up, patch them up, uh, and, and, and use it as a salve as well. And I think mm -hmm. that often we, we, we look to, um, we look to be very judgmental on people as to say, God, get them. You see, they doing wrong <laughs> as opposed to saying, Lord, have mercy on them. Right. God reveal yourself. One of the most profound statements that Jesus said on the cross after being, uh, whipped, beat with a cat of nine tails after being, uh, all night through all, so many unlawful tribunals, after being beat, after having a crown of thorns on his head, after having to carry his cross to the point he couldn't carry it anymore. So Joseph had to carry it a little bit further. After being uh, you know, nailed to the cross, all those things he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And so often as ministers and people of God, we have to be able to have that uh, I, I like to call it spiritual emotional intelligence to be able to say, God, they really don't understand the magnitude of what they're doing right now. God, reveal it to them because this is the catch. Reveal it to them like you had to do to me, too, because sometimes we forget the stuff that we did last summer. Sometimes we forget the stuff that we had struggled with for so, so long. And so that that's where that transparency piece comes into play and say, man, I know you're struggling with this. I know you're dealing with this. I know you had this setback. I know it seems like life is insurmountable and catastrophic, but let me tell you, God can get you through this. And this is how he did it for me. And so sharing that, that, that those testimonies, I believe can get us to the place with less religiosity mm -hmm. and more compassion. Pastor Brown, anything? Woo. I just saw that. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a copy of that book. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, man. So the Bible, the Bible says um, that. Remember the occasion where, but his mind made me go back to this because it, it's all inclusive in this ministry piece. Um, it's interesting how it is that when Jesus would come to a city, the state, the city would would become stirred with anticipation. They may not have been able to define it, but what happens is his spirit always precedes him. Uh -huh. And so as Jesus would come, the city would become full of expectation. And so people understood Jesus is coming. My needs will be met. But if, if, you, if you keep on looking at it, the Bible says that not only were the people coming out and withdrawing him, there were scriptures that say that the children began to throw on him. Now think about this. Now, if, if he had been looking like a big, stubborn, mean, scoured man, do you think the children would have been drawn to him, running to him, gathering around him? They gathered around him to the extent where the apostles thought, hold on, wait a minute. The apostles were like, wait a minute, back up. And Jesus, Jesus looked at them and said, oh, wait a minute. Suffer little children to come unto me yeah. and forbid them not. But theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And, and so I said I wanted to say that, see, because Elder Green said it, if we learn how to mimic Jesus, mm. see, one of the first things that we're going to understand, if God calls you somewhere to minister, then 
you have to be you have to be touchable and you have to be applicable because if people if people don't feel comfortable in approaching you uh, then then they're going there be there, there will be obstacles in the way of you reaching them yeah they can hear your word it ain't that you can't preach right but but it, is it applicable can I, can I touch you is it is it all right if i ask you a question you, you said this how, how do i do this uh you said this but how do i take this and so you know we, we've got to be where jesus was just for god so loved the world that he gave and i think we forget about love sometimes you know it's, it's i think when we start loving folk i think we'll find ministry a whole lot easier yes sir uh, and, and other green and i talked about this, we talked about this years ago uh real early in ministry one of the things that we learned early was when God places people in ministry with you, you take care of the people that take care of you. When when God blesses you with people, be good to your people, take care of them. Yeah. Right. Don't, don't, don't try to stop in front of other people and forget about the people that are there when they know about you. You know, the folk that's carrying your bag. You ain't asking to, but they pick up your bag and start carrying it because, you know, because they want you to prosper. Yes. So, so we've got to learn how to appreciate the things that God does around us. Hmm. And I, I love that. Yeah, that's that. That's you know both. I don't know why y'all not this. This room should have a thousand plus folk in it. I mean, because the gold nuggets that's coming out of these minds tonight, you don't get everywhere. This is for free. Y'all don't have to register for nothing. <laughs> have to pay for nothing, <laughs> right? We're, we're sharing. <laughs> Our experiences, we're sharing true good knowledge. We're not anyway. That's that's we're not bamboozling. We don't got the crafty speech tonight. We don't got the we're saying it. We don't have to impress me. What we have is to pick you up, pick you up tonight, right? Encourage tonight, strengthen tonight. So in 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 ministry, uh, so far we talked about the butchering. Uh, let's talk about a resetting or a healing process for folk. Um, because a lot of folk come from religious backgrounds. And actually, I do want to do this real quick because I I, I totally forgot last time. Totally forgot. Uh, dear God, we thank you for what you've done tonight. Dear God, forgive me for even opening up with prayer. I pray that someone be delivered. I pray someone be set free. I pray they even know who you are. The ones that don't know who you are. I pray that, that not only the anointing of the Lord will shift this Facebook place, but this place that we're in right now, I pray that the anointing will arrest every demonic spirit, bison, voice, demon, be, be destroyed, be canceled, be nullified, be constricted and restrained by the blood of the Lord Jesus. And I return you back to the pits of hell. That God, I thank you right now that our mouthpieces will not be hindered. No type of uh, uh, retaliation or counterattacks will come to our dwelling in the name of the Lord Jesus. But I pray right now, the freedom and the anointing of the Lord will set the captives free yes. tonight. Yes. Jesus' name. Yes. Now we can continue. So nevertheless, the, uh, the, the resetting and the refreshing of who we are in Christ, yes. our mouthpieces are meant, even like the last colloquy, what happened there or in that moment will be magnitude. Reminds me of Job. Everything about him double. Double. Mm -hmm. People don't see double right now. People don't yeah. see they got a ministry right now. They don't see faith what? They, and, you know, it's sad that people are in the place right now. It reminds me of the Sago mine. When they figured out that two were dead and 11 were alive, they were singing praises in the church. In the church, right? Mm -hmm. When they figured out 11 had, had died mm -hmm. and two were alive, mm -hmm. them same folks said, what on earth has God done for us? Mm -hmm. But out of the abundance of their heart, they just spoke that, oh, praise God. Never mind the two that they thought were deceased. This is how mm -hmm. quick folk is. God ain't moved for me yet, so let me quit. Mm -hmm. God let sickness come on. Don't we know that good and evil he created? Mm -hmm. Good and evil, he created that scripture. So people looking right now, why would God create a pandemic? Why did he do it in the in the days of Egypt? Because he's a God to, to get folks 
attention, number one, it gives you a freedom of choice. People say the first sin on earth was eating of uh, the, the, the fruit. I'll say that. No, the first sin was pride in heaven. Pride in heaven. And, and people go here that pride is had, can take you two ways. You can have a pride, sense of pride. I, I often say pride is the biggest inside joke played on you by you. It, it, <laughs> it gets you messed up. And it starts within yourself. Pride didn't start with anybody else. And so I think in order to get that reset, and I want to speak to anyone right now that's going through that right now. You, you, you feel like, you know, I'm going through all this type of stuff and, and I'm living safe. I'm trying to do everything that I'm going through and the devil is just on my heels. But as uh, Dr. Shelton said, it's not always the devil. Sometimes it's God. And, and I'll give you Bible for that. Often our struggles are either authorized or arranged by God. In the instance of Job, God authorized it. Have thou considered my servant Job? He authorized Satan. Touch everything he has except his life. He authorized it. But we look at in the instance of Jesus, the Bible said that the spirit of God led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted in all points. And so he was arranged. And so some of times we go through things that we think that is the devil, but it's all actually God either authorizing or arranging your struggle so that he can bring you forth and be able to manifest what he's already spoken and seen in you. And so I tell people all the time, you can't be an overcomer without turmoil. You can't see healing without being sick. You can't see God bless you finance your finances without being broke. And so there's certain type of opposition that has to come before miracles come. Lastly, in order to get that reset, I believe that God has to break certain cycles. A very fascinating book in scripture, if you look at the book of Judges, it is interesting because all over and over it gives you several different accounts. And it'll say that something to this effect. It will say, and the people of God did evil in the sight of the Lord, and therefore God <laughs> rose up such and such. And so he gives us these examples of judges from Deborah to, uh, to Gideon to several other judges. But the common thread was they were on a cycle spiraling out of control. And then God rose up a leader or a group of leaders that got the people of God back on course that reset them. And the cycle that they were on was number one, rebellion, which led to God's retribution, their punishment, which then led to restoration. And so often we're in that same cycle. And before we could get that reset, God sends a pandemic. God <clears throat> sends some other uh, thing because he said, okay, you rebelled against me. Now I have to punish you, but I'm not going to leave you there. I'm going to restore you. And so we see that even in the book of Isaiah, the, the book of Isaiah, we call it the Bible within the Bible because it's 66 <laughs> chapters in the book of Isaiah, just like there's 66 books of the Bible. And similarly to the Bible, the first 39 uh, chapters are similar to the first 39 books of the Bible. First 39 deals with God's wrath, God's judgment, uh, God's retribution. But then the latter 27 books, just like the latter 27 uh, chapters of Isaiah deals with God's grace. And so we see in the first 39 chapters of Isaiah, God is speaking against their rebellion, speaking against their black backsliding, speaking how he's going to punish them, speaking of how he's going to do things. Then we get to chapter 40 and he begins to say, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, for they have received double for all of their sins. And for the latter part of that Isaiah, he begins to just speak comfort to them. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings of eagles. They shall run and not get weary. They shall walk and not faint. He begins to speak of a Messiah that's going to come and going to comfort them. And so for some of us, what God is doing is he's breaking those cycles. And you might have been stuck on that punishment side of God, thinking that you're going to be there forever. But on the other side of the punishment is always reset, always restoration, always God trying to get you back to the rightful place. Just as he told Joel, you know, we get into Joel and we get excited about how he talks about pouring out the Holy Ghost and his spirit upon all flesh. And as charismatic Pentecostal apostolic folks, we love that. But we skip over the main uh, premise of it is restoration. I will restore unto you the years that the canker worm has stolen, the palmer worm and that great army, that what? I sent you, not the devil, 
I sent you to get you back to the place of reset, to get you back to the place of restoration, to get you back on track to what I already know I want you to do and where I want you to go. And so that was a long answer to say that God has your restoration in mind and he hasn't forgot about the church. He didn't just drop us in the middle of a pandemic for the church to die, but he dropped us in the middle of the pandemic to prune us, to purge us and to get us on on, on course for one of the greatest revivals that this world has ever seen. Uh, Pastor Brown. No, you go ahead. You, was, you, you finished. Uh, to, I, I believe that the Lord has us in a place. But he can't, he can only do so much until we do a few things. We've got to turn, we got to repent. T turn and repent, even if that's the only two words that was in the Bible, mm. we're uncomfortable with those two words mm. because repenting, oh, I can quit, but it went and until your mind changes. Mm. Yes, sir. Until your yes. mind changes, right. I can repent all day long, but still, go, but still go out and steal a bottle of water, go out again, <laughs> repent. But until I change my mind, you know what? <laughs> Let me pay for this bottle of water. So, you know, until I have a mind shift because the renewing of our minds is just not spiritual. Yes, it's natural, but we get mixed up in the point of that. If we take God at our word, he going to do it for me. Yes. Yes, he will. But what are you going to sacrifice to him? Worship is a sacrifice. Let me tell you why it's a sacrifice. Anybody, let's take Abraham. Let's take Moses. Let's take anybody that's influential in the Bible. To sacrifice anything in that Old Testament time was for me to lay down my son right now. <laughs> the, 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 the thought of it, to sacrifice, to sacrifice it to the Lord. Now, he trusted him so much that until he got here, mm -hmm. until he got here, right? So when we get to a point of where we are tonight, some people is like this tonight. You know what I'm saying? Some people is like this tonight. Some people is like this tonight. Some people is like this tonight. Some people is like this tonight, throwing the Bible away. So we hitting a whole lot of different topics tonight. So sacrifice in worship is I got to die to my flesh so my soul can live. I got to die to this thing called my flesh. That's a sacrifice to some, a sacrifice to many, because if you don't have a renewing of your mind, yes, the Lord can still work it out because he gives us still the freedom of choice, freedom of choice. He ain't going to make nobody serve him. He could, he could. He could, he could say, everybody under the face of the, you're going to serve me. But he want to see where your heart is. So if we pause right now, somewhere in this equation, somebody out here right now is in somewhere in the categories we talked about tonight. So just so far, mm -hmm. just so far. And there's something that's pulling on you. There's something that is vexing you. And even if you don't got the Holy Ghost, let's go here. Because some people, well, I don't got the Holy Ghost. You still got something called a conscience, first of all. If you go out here and you steal, the Holy Ghost don't got to tell you it's wrong. Let's go here. Because I, I feel that in my spirit. Well, I don't got the Holy Ghost, but I still know wrong from wrong. Yes, you do. But you know what? I told my friend, Pastor Brown, Elder Green, I'll share this with you. I know an individual right now who has read the Bible through 15 times, but has no desire to live for the Lord. Now, I said, I said to this individual, I said, can I ask you this? I said, you've read the Bible that many times, but there's nothing in there, nothing about the Lord that makes you want to serve him. Not, nothing, not, nothing, 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 nothing at all. She said, no, it's, but it's, it, it's a beautiful story. Mm -hmm. I said, let me ask you this. If you would go out and get the best chef book in the world mm -hmm. and it was gifted to you, there's nothing in there that you would ever want to cook, nothing mm -hmm. you would ever want to bake. Nothing you would ever want to fix? Well, sure there is. So there ain't nothing in here that you ever want to try. Nothing yeah. you ever want to taste. Nothing okay. you ever want to live for. Nothing you ever want to be jump-started in you? No. I said, well, that's a dangerous place to be because scripture said, 
couple different instances. I said, honey, you don't want to be like you to know you've been better off ne never knowing the word, never off better hearing. But th the point is, I'm saying is there's people out here right now that know this, that will listen to this, that are listening right now, that is yet to apply this. We don't get into the shower and not use soap. Right? We 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 don't we don't go to a restaurant, as Pastor Brown says, and not eat good food. We we don't, we should go into the church, and we talked about this several minutes ago, expecting the faith level for the people was so much so. Why do you think in these uh crusades, people that are waiting in the line get healed first? Mm -hmm. Their expectation level mm -hmm. before they even enter the sanctuary. It's already so much so that when they did meet Jesus, oh, th did you not hear? He's coming. Like Pastor Brown, did you, can, so if Jesus would come into our church house, he would first of all be rejected because he don't, that's the re now, we can go back to the first conversation we had because a lot of us get rejected because of how our image is. Now, we know come as you are is not biblical, but we do know come in decency and modesty. We understand that. We're not saying that if you come in here with jeans and a t-shirt, you're not welcome. We're not saying that. But we're not saying come in here with, with the skirt all the way up that y'all get what I'm saying. So don't, don't try to twist it here. We're saying that y'all are welcome, first of all, to the house of the Lord. You're welcome. You're welcome. I, I think I grew up uh, where I had a very wise pastor and first lady who would often admonish those of us who are on the evangelism team and ministry and those things. It says, uh, don't try to clean the fish before you get them out the water. And so often we try to impose culture on people before we have even won them. And so what I've understood is, and I know it's frustrating when you see somebody that's read the Bible 15 times, it seems like they're not getting anything out of it. There's one thing that I know that's true. The word says God word, God's word will not return unto him void, but it shall prosper. It shall accomplish that which he please in the thing with us so to he sends it. That's number one. Number two, I understand this about ministry that one waters, one plants, but God gives the increase. And so I don't take it as personal anymore because whether I'm planting or whether I'm watering, it's up to God to give the increase. Number that's three, God sometimes has to illuminate people at different times. Mm -hmm. If you look at, you know, Saul before he became uh, uh, Paul, uh, you, you look at how he was blinded and he had to go to the man of God uh, for that blindness to be taken off his eyes. And so what I've learned to do is just, as Elder Brown do, smile, give him love, continue to share the word. I've literally seen countless atheists and agnostics that told me they would never believe in God. And, and the next thing you know, they're going down in Jesus name, because the more they tried to deny, the more that God began to reveal. I say that again, the more that they tried to deny, the more God would reveal. In fact, when you look at the scriptures, God never spends a lot of time trying to convince somebody that he's God. He convinces them by showing them the things that he does. And by virtue of the things he does, there is no other explanation but God. And right. so what I just do is, is I show God's word and allow God to reveal it to them in a way that nobody could do this but God. You don't see God ever in the New Testament or Old Testament trying to convince, trying to argue someone down that <laughs> I am the true and living God. He just shows them by virtue of what he does. And then uh, the revelation begins the process. So I think uh, that's where that love piece comes into play. And, and, and I think without being too long winded, we, we sometimes have a tr have trouble with that in our persuasions, because we think that that means letting down, compromising, being too soft. Mm -hmm. And we feel like if I, if I don't come down with the hammer, then I'm not doing the gospel a justice mm -hmm. and God never wanted us uh, to necessarily be the gospel's defense attorney. He wanted us to be the witness. In, in fact, apologetics means defense of the gospel, but defense in the gospel as being a witness. The book of Acts tells us to be his witness. He never told us to be his defense attorney. And so I think that's the problem that the church has. 
if you witness, a witness can only tell of things that they've seen, they've heard, they've experienced. And that's what we do as a witness. It's not my job to defend the gospel. Dr. Johnny James, the walking Bible, one of my great mentors says, uh, the gospel is like a pit bull. It don't need no defense. You just let it go to defend itself. And wow. so that's what the Bible is like. Let it go. <laughs> you know, and, and it's, that's, that's all we can do. I mean, Jesus, even in his own town, just, and went on. He literally went on. And, and it's, it's to the point where all, all, all you can do sometimes is dust off the dust, shake it off mm -hmm. and go on. And, and he did a few miracles, preached, went on. And, you know, I believe now we're in this time, everybody has used this pandemic and epidemic for what they want to do from Jump Street. The folk that was tired of church gave them an excuse to stay home. The folks that was tired of pastoring and preaching gave them an excuse to get out of it. But whether they know it or not, as we said, we're not the, we're not the judge, we're not the jury, neither are we the trial. Neither are we the persons uh, 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 choosing the jurors. But we know this, that what we have to do is not only just work out our own soul salvation, but I'll say this, we are in an age now of where uh, 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 Elder Green, you, you just said it, and, and, and it made me think about fishermen, right? Mm -hmm. The job of a fisherman has two things. Jesus said, fisher of men, not fishermen. Fisher of men preserves, fisherman kills, mm -hmm. right? So fisher of men is the thing that we are to preserve. Fishermen don't care nothing about saving no fish. You look at Delia's catch. Now, the fisher of men, if they're looking to preserve the crab, they're fisher of men. If they're looking for bait, they're fishermen, mm -hmm. right? So we as fisher of men, people get fishermen. No, 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 no. It's fisher of men because we have a great role to play. We're fisher, which means we're doing everything we can to preserve, to help bring you. Because when all of the earth in the land is preached to, people don't understand. Uh, Pastor Brown and I had this conversation all the time. There will be no laying hands in heaven. There'll be no preaching in heaven. Your works is here. Mm -hmm. Your works is here. So we're trying to say tonight, if you get into a car, you never put gas in it. You never check the oil. You never get your tires rotated. You never get new tires. You never upkeep it. Something about that vehicle ain't going to work. <laughs> That's right. It's not going to work. So these gifts and callings, yes, they come repentance. Why do you think we see prophets and we see spiritual sorcerers, <clears throat> wizards and warlocks? It's not by chance that the enemy sees and hears the same thing. <laughs> it's not by chance. But who, who is working in you? Who's operating in you? So we say this tonight that knows who you are. He didn't, we said he didn't get beat. He didn't carry the cross. We can go for days and hours and scriptures talking about what he did for us. What are we going to, if the word comes back, sacrifice, comes back to reset, comes back to refresh. What are we going to do today? Tomorrow ain't promise. Yes, we know we got the rapture, but we all have an appointed time. What are we going to do today? Y'all out, out there in this land called Facebook, YouTube, when we upload it, what are y'all going to do tonight, today? this evening, whatever day, whatever hour you're watching this, what are you going to do with what, just what you just heard thus far tonight? Is it going to cause you to pick this back up and maybe restart fresh again? Is it going to cause you to get into a church? Know the church house. I hear feel that too, like a ton of rocks. Know the church house don't save you. Know the preacher behind that pulpit don't save you. No, we can go here. Making that drive, we make a drive 45 minutes every Sunday. That don't save me getting that vehicle. That don't save me. <laughs> as much as I love my father and his preaching, he's a preaching fool. That don't save me. That don't save me. I can't look and say, Lord, my father preached that message. Let me in. Mm -hmm. Hey, I heard Elder Roger Green and Pastor R. Brown preach messages. I know you're going to let me in. No. <laughs> no. So on tonight, I want to segue into Pastor Brown. Um, you've been in ministry a, a very long time as well, and uh, you've discipled many in various areas. 
And where is it, where is it that you have seen the last two years? And we can we can use the pandemic as, as a huge equation. What is it that you've seen in the people of God that they need to refresh or start this engine again to get them where they should be in God? I mean, we know Bible reading, but what is it that's made them lackadaisical that they don't come to church, don't believe in tithing and, and doing offering? That, that's you almost curse words there. They don't believe in fasting and praying. They don't believe in what mm. is it that is it just because they're lackadaisical or is it because as we talked earlier they feel like god has just failed them and why, why serve him at all wow because I, because bro before you start this is what i feel i feel like i hear what they're saying i heard what elder green said but why serve him anyway why, why, why go from Genesis to Revelation? Why go from Psalms to Prophet? Because I don't know. It's like it's slapping me in the face. Why still serve him when such and such has died? When such and such has happened? When I've lost this? What, what, what is it that has caused them to be here? What you've seen in ministry? And what can they do today, right now, out of the sound of your voice? What can they do in the Lord? Because it's going to be a hard thing, heart thing. What can they do right now to shake themselves loose? Man, that's a great question. I uh, I had several things running through my mind. Listen, I, I heard a, a preacher preach a profound message one time, and the subject of the message was inventory in the pig pen. And, and while you were talking, uh, that that's what was stirring in my spirit was inventory. You know, there, there are times when we need to just, we need to pause for a moment to take inventory as to where we are, what are we doing, and who are we with? And, and when we start there, I, I believe that that would shift our minds to a paradigm because we need some changes. Um, I, can, I, can't, I can't call myself a man of God, if I'm never with the people of God. I call myself a man of God, but, but, but none of my friends are saved. No, but I'm a man of God. We say things, and I think we say things without thinking, because there are times when we get comfortable doing what we're doing. But if we can pause long enough to take some inventory, where am I, who am I with, and what am I doing? I, I think it'll cause us to, to be stirred to some get some conclusions of as to if, where am I going? That's the next question. Okay, so where am I going? You know, because there's a whole lot of people talking about heaven. Okay, well, what does heaven consist of? Uh, because the Bible says that the thief and the robber won't be there. And somebody may say, well, well, I don't steal. Well, have you stole somebody's influence? Have, have you have you robbed up somebody's influence? They, they had good character and people thought highly of them, but you stole it. Mm. Uh, so I mean, so 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 have we are we a thief? I mean, you, you don't have to be you don't have to run a Kroger and steal a snicker in order to be a thief. So sometimes you can start talking about folk and belittle them and steal their influence. Whether we know it or not, the enemy loves to steal the influence of the people of God. See, we don't, we don't, we don't think about the things that God does in us. We, we talk about too many things that are superfluity. And, 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 when, we, and when we started, when you started talking about, okay, well, how, what do we do to enter into ministry? Sometimes one of the first things we do when we start talking about ministry or I've been called to preach, we don't get a good cordless mic. Well, you know, before you get a good court, let's 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 start having something else. Let, first of all, let's get some word. Let's get some word in my heart. Let's let's allow the word of God to become established in my heart. Uh, let it become applicable and let me live what I'm getting ready to say. One great thing about ministry that we've got to go back to understanding is that we're going to be first partakers of the fruit. 
And, and so if God is going to use me, if he's going to speak through me, if he's going to give me a message for the people, then he's going to he's going to try me. That's right. The message has to stir in me. I have to be moved by the word of God first in order to try to implement the words of the people of God. And so I think that we need to stop and think about who we are, where are we, who are we with, and where do I want to go? You know, because yeah, I'm sorry, y'all, but but some 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 listen, it's too much lying in Christianity. <laughs> I, I, I told somebody confused, make me stutter. Who how do we get so good at lying? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't understand sometimes. I mean, bro, I just I ain't even trying to be funny. That's not facetious at all. Oh, we just lie too much. Listen, we exaggerate. Listen, anytime you be <laughs> you're lying. We we embellish stuff. We were, I was, was I talking to somebody the other day. Listen, when you start dealing with the things of God, um, and and, and at the green. Roger, I'm say I'm going to talk to him like I, like the Apostle Paul talked to the people of God. Like, Roger, bless you, man. <laughs> yes, sir. That's what my mama named me, so call me Roger. <laughs> he, he said, he said. Now, if I was getting ready to introduce him, I, I would I would introduce him as as Elder Roger Green, disciple. I, call, I used to call him Disciple Green all the time. <laughs> but but he was he started talking about the Word of God. He said, "Man, the Word of God is like a a rock baller. It's it's like a pit bull." Let it go. You ain't never seen nobody at the park shielding their pit bull or their rock wall. Don't go. Don't go. Yeah, right. Right. If anything, they got an extra grip on that leash trying not to be like he's too familiar. Right. And so let's let's get back to the place where we understand the word of God in its proper context and its right context connotation. Because when we do that, when, when we do that, what, what happens is the word of God is stand all by itself. And we don't have to, we don't, you, listen, Jesus, the Bible says, and, 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 and we are, I have given him a name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every name must bow and every tongue must confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. We talk about it. See, we say things, and we have to realize that we say things just for us. It's not for Jesus. So, so when you when you when you say Jesus, it's power all by itself. But we, what we try to do is we try to embellish or we try to put superlatives on it. Like, let me give you this example. Wonderful Jesus. Okay, that was for me. That wasn't for him. Just saying Jesus is all I need to say, but he's wonderful to me. That was that was for me because that's an expression of, of what he is to me. Right. And so we've got to understand these things. And, and, and because you're saying one for Jesus, that didn't do anything for him. That was for me. That, that was my expression. I just want you to know what he is to me. So so we have to understand the context. You know, so sometimes we we put superlatives and we try to embellish stuff. Listen, man, if we want to be powerful. If, if we want to see things change, let's get back to saying things exactly like the Lord Jesus said them. If you, if you want to see stuff move, and, uh, if you want to see stuff transient, if you really want to see a, a, a shift, y'all know that love, we love that word. If you really want to see a shift, let's start saying things the way the Lord speaks. Talk like Jesus and see what happens. And, and I, I feel too, that you didn't have the disciples saying 12 different things. Jesus coming back. No, he's not coming back. Baptize this way. No, don't baptize that way. Uh, uh, no, do this. They were all on one accord. Now, we know Judas. We understand Peter. We understand it. But they were all on one accord. They all preached the same thing. They had different perspectives, but different timelines. We get that. But, you know, um, I think people, you said it, Pastor Brown, people give an excuse what's convenient for them at the time. And they feel like if they can do more self idolistic worship, God will hear them more. Tower of Babel. Tower of Babel. It got so much that they didn't get God's attention because they built the tower. It's because they all got on one accord. It wasn't until they got on one accord. They said, let me go down and see, because these jokers on one accord, and they build, yeah, okay, the tower is, is okay. This, this, but when they got on one accord, now people take that. If I can praise and worship more, whether you whisper now, 
I get it. If you in the state of the limit, you're going to holler Jesus. Atheists can holler Jesus. No many living for him. But when you have a relationship with him and you have found him right where you are, maybe I should break it down more what Pastor Brown said. Let him find you where you are. Yes, leadership will tell you to worship and praise. Come on, folks, lift your hands. Come on, we got to set it up. But you should already come in with the spirit of worship, spirit of praise. You should already want to come in with Thanksgiving. Everybody don't have that. So that's why when we get a mic in their hand for a half hour, 45 minutes to an hour, praise and worship service doesn't impress God. Hmm. Let me tell you why. The worship inside of your heart does. Notice hmm. I said praise and worship service. Mm-hmm. we got a lot of that going on just because you come there and you sing worship songs don't mean you're worshiping don't mean you're praising because we have a lot of this big eyes if i can just touch his throne if you can't do it in your bedroom you can't do it in your car you can't do it in your time of worshiping and studying and praying what makes it seem and the pastor brown said it when well, you get a mic in your hand now now you want to give him this sacrificial worship but when you at home TikTok, TikTok is all we hear. TikTok, TikTok. But it's awfully funny that when you have a relationship, it shows on, oh, watch this, on your job and off your job. Uh oh, uh oh. Because it seemed like now this cussing demon is real big now at the saints of God. It's always been here, it's always been prevalent. But I'm seeing that now the folk on these Facebook lives now, I'm just telling as it is. And this now this vexed me, y'all. Vex me. I'm not going to say the time, date, place, or, or person's name, but I'm going to say that the instance. Don't get mad at me for cursing because everybody do it. No, everybody don't do it. Everybody don't do that. Because you mean to tell me that when God doesn't change in you, he does it halfway? Mm-hmm. Don't mean that your flesh day ain't going to rise, but you're not going to keep it under subjection? Yeah, I, I think for me, I mean, so much has, has been said so great by you and Elder Brown right there. I think John Maxwell said it best. He said, everything rises and falls on leadership. And I think for me, I I apologize to the body as a leader on behalf of leaders. Mm -hmm. I think right now we can't expect those in the body of Christ to do anything greater than the leadership that we're seeing displayed. And so what Mm -hmm. I see is a lot of leaders that are fainting in the day of adversity. I see a lot of leaders Mm -hmm. who are not truly connected to God in in the sense of of seeking after God passionately to have a relationship with him, to be able to understand and hear the directives and the orders to disperse to the body. And so what is happening is you can't blame the body from deteriorating when the head is deteriorating first. And so as a leader, I think we have to get back to the place of seeking God's face passionately because leadership does good leadership does this good leadership inspires you know i i often say you know motivation is uh, is often mm, I, I think it's fool's gold but inspiration is is not and i say that to say you really can't motivate people you know people got to find motivation within and of themselves but they can be inspired to motivation and so when you inspire someone it, it, it changes the course of their actions. And, and also we can empower people. And what my dad mm-hmm. taught me this when I grew up, he said, empowering doesn't necessarily mean giving someone power as much as it means not taking the power that they already have in them. And so what we got to do is we have to see the goals, the, the passion, uh, the gifts that they have within them and foster those as leaders. And, and, and start giving a sense of accountability in the church, even within our dreams and in our visions. There's a lot of forward thinkers, but not a lot of forward doers. And so that's what we have. We got a lot of people just talking about a whole lot of stuff. I do this, I do that, this, that, and other, but not a whole lot of people doing anything. And so my biggest challenge to the people that I, I lead is to stop talking about what God has told you to do and what he's given to you. If you hadn't written it down, if you haven't committed it to a plan, because a, a dream without a plan has no accountability. And so I say that to say that I really believe that what God is doing is he's shifting us to a point of accountability is saying, OK, 
It's time to redeem the time. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let's go forth. Let's see souls healed, delivered, set free. Let's start putting down real sustainable goals, dreams, and visions for the body of Christ, for our church, for our community. You know, don't give me the fact that church shouldn't be in politics and political and we should just stay in the church. No, we should affect every fabric of society known to man. We should be the ones that are telling them what should be done in government, telling them what should be done in the school board, telling them what should be done in our community, because God is giving us insight that he's downloading to us from the ancient of days, from the alpha to the omega, from the first to the last, from the beginning to the ending. He's giving us the mind of God. And so I say that to say that I blame leadership. I blame us uh, before I blame the rank and file, the laity, those of us that are leaders that have been given this great task, this great responsibility, this great burden and weight of ministry. We got to refocus. We got to wake up. We got to get back to the place because if we get to a certain place, trust me, those dynamic attributes of a leader will compel people to do stuff. Listen, I grew up with some of the greatest leaders known to man, Paul Alexander Bowers, uh, Bishop Wagner, uh, Bishop, Bishop uh, uh, Monroe Saunders, Bishop Ross Paddock, Doc, uh, Bishop Edward C. Roberts. You know, some of these great men and even great women of God that were so dynamic, they didn't do a whole lot of talking about stuff that, that did not matter. They stuck in the word, gave you a passionate, concise, precise anointed word and showed you how to live holy through their lifestyle. And so I think as leaders, if we begin to mirror that type of behavior, people will come back to Christ in droves. The problem is, is they've lost respect with us. And in, in doing so, they've, they've lost respect with the church. I mean, that's, you can't say it in, in any better. Um, and, 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 I, and I totally 100% agree, agree that people, and I hate to say this, but people behind the podiums and the pulpits, folk idolize them. They wanna be like them. As you said, their influence is very strong. So yes, pastors, preachers, leaders, what you say makes a difference. And we, and we, we have seen this being said all these years religiousness says let me preach them in hell but when do you ever pull them out mm -hmm. when did you ever pull them out when did you ever say brother you can make it sister you can make it folk come to church uh and we got stories for days and this one i shared i share with with uh with roger when we came to the church years ago for help she come in she was a waitress and uh came into the church and that bishop said, never get it. She was going to drive off a bridge. Now, drive off a bridge. And uh, came in to get help. Tears, mascara coming down her face. And she said, I stopped here to get help. That mm -hmm. bishop said that night, honey, I love you, but you got them pants on. I said, this woman just told you she's going to drive off a bridge. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't, the only two people that went to, to encompass her was my father and my mother. She said, I appreciate what you've done, but the damage has been done. I never should have stopped. And we saw her years later. And you want to know what? How you doing? Are you in church? She said, I never stepped foot back in the church. And that had been 20 years later. 20 years later. Never stepped foot back in the church. So yes, words do hurt. They hurt. Especially when you come into the church of the Lord house of the Lord, thinking you're going to get help. That's why at the beginning of this, 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 this whole colloquy, we said the smile makes a difference. It used to be smear meant you was holy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know, used to be, they didn't laugh, you know, cause we all grew up in a day where you didn't do this. You didn't wear that. You didn't go, you, you didn't do nothing except pray fast and go to church. Right. And, and so, I can't blame them for what right. they did not know back then. Right. That's right. That's a, right. a lot of that was in ignorance. A lot of that was in <laughs> not being educated. It, it is a lot of them was was mirroring some of the bad behavior that they had seen. We have no excuse right now. I can't. It, those things were catastrophic. They, they were 
you know, deafening. They were hard on the church. And so now I think our generation, we should be on a PR campaign like never before, repairing the image of the church, letting people understand that we're not like the perception of what you thought we were back in the day. Those people will not understand our culture and our, you know, subculture of, of our church and why they did certain things and how we made certain blunders. We can't go back there and explain that to them. But what we can do is model a different behavior now and show them something different. Show them that this was never our intention. Show them that this is how we've grown. Listen, I think just that in and of itself, I've had some older uh, uh, mentors of mine that have admitted some of the wrongdoing they've done. And that in and of itself gave me a higher respect for them. And so in the church, I think if we start doing that, begin to share with them, look, there's some things we could have done better. None of us are perfect. We're all growing in grace. But the same grace that I'm giving you, please give that to the church. Please give that to the man and woman of God. Please give that to me because it is a mutual respect that we have for each other that we're still trying to figure this out till we all come into the unity of the faith. That means it is a process of us going from one place to the next and growing in grace. And so I think when people see that type of genuine love, genuine compassion, genuine uh, humility, not this fake faux humility that we trot out sometimes to try mm -hmm. to act like we're meek and holy, but we're as arrogant as anyone has ever seen. Uh, when they see true humility and, and, and that true heart of love and compassion, I believe people will give us that grace and understand that we're not perfect and understand that we necessarily don't have to be on a platform. But when they understand that our heart is truly towards God and getting this right, that the reason why we did some of those things is really because we just want it to be right. And when people see that, uh, they, they'll understand fully that it's not a self-righteousness. It is a, us wanting to be righteous. And that's the difference. Pastor Brown. Woo. Where, you, where do you start after that? <laughs> that, that, that was, yes, sir. Thank you, thank you sir. Um, that is great, man. When he said that, he heard one of the uh, early mentors, you know, apologize for some of the error, some of the ways that they were erroneous. And that stuff is powerful, man. Yes, sir. And it, and it takes us, you know, everything we're saying, what we're going to do is going to always take us back to the word of God. The Bible says, confess your faults one to another that you may be healed. It doesn't, that doesn't necessarily mean I have a heart murmur. So sometimes I'm, I'm in my in my heart. I'm spiritually heartbroken. Mm. Sometimes just by obeying the word of God, I can heal that place in my spirit. See, people 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 need to be healed. We we need a healing. We need to be restored. Uh, he said something very powerful when he was speaking. He, he was talking about his father said, "Now to empower somebody is not necessarily to give them power." See. I, one, one of the errors of our ways, some ways that we're erroneous is that sometimes we think the only way that we can empower people is to give them a, a position or a title. Where if we understand the word of God, we'll understand that the word of God had already positioned, transitioned, and progressed men. Mm -hmm. they, they, all that was already embedded in them, like, like, like the... Um, Deacons that, that they, he said, he said, find some men that are full of the Holy Ghost. And what I found interesting about that is that these men, I, I found through, through homological studies um, and historical studies, that these men were already renowned in the community. And that just woke up on, on some men, you know, because we know your daddy or your, 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 your cousin. Seven men that are full of the Holy Ghost. And what they and, 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 and two uh, specifically were Stephen and Philip. Mm -hmm. If you will remember, Deacon Philip was down on the river. Revival. That's what that's when the Holy Ghost uh, led him to leave the revival early and to go down to Gaza Strip. I used to read that, y'all. I'd be wondering what was Deacon Philip doing running the revival? Deacon Philip. Mm -hmm. 
The Bible says that the Holy Ghost led you down there. Listen, listen, there were two things involved in this. Deacon Philip was down there running the revival. He was baptized and spoke in Jesus' name, and they were being filled with the Holy Ghost. The Bible said that the Holy Ghost moved on him to lead the revival early. One, one, listen, watch this. So a lot of us, if we got there baptized and spoke in Jesus' name and folk received the Holy Ghost, y'all know we ain't leaving. <laughs> yeah, right. We call him Roger and we call him a death. It's an explosion down here. <laughs> what? What? Listen, I ain't going nowhere. But be, listen, no, no. The Bible said the Holy Ghost moved on Philip and he left. He, he sent for the apostles to come to carry on the revival. Mm -hmm. The Holy Ghost moved him out on the Gaza Strip. And if you think about it, he started a whole new revival. But my thought was, what was Deacon Philip doing? But but listen, man, I ran, I ran into some studies, man. Philip and Stephen were renowned before they were ordained as deacons. Mm. They, they, listen, they live the Bible. They love God with all their heart. They Listen, they love God so much until they would meditate on God and pray, until the Holy Ghost would just move on them. They were doing miracle signs and wonders in the community before they were ordained as deacons. Because God met them where they were. Yes, sir. And that's, yes, where, sir. that's what I meant by empowering is not so much giving power as much as is not taking away the power that God has already given yes. someone. I'll yeah. give you this one example. I'll never forget, I was 16 years old, getting ready to drive, just got my license. Dad had bought a car. And so I was excited because he was about to give me the keys. He was teaching me how to drive. I was very excited. I'm about to have my car. I'm going to be on the road. And so there was a brother in Christ who uh, had a family at the time. I think he had maybe four kids, newly married, maybe only married five, five years or so. And that, you know, in that very fragile, delicate point of marriage, when you're still trying to figure it out, uh, had children early on in the marriage. And so, you know, he and his wife were still trying to figure things out. And so he came to my dad the exact same day that my dad bought the car. He had <laughs> lost his job, could, didn't have a way to go on interviews, all of these things. And so my dad felt compelled because he loved the young man, loved him like, like he was his own son. And he, he asked him, he said, he said uh, I know you lost your job. I know you're struggling. Do you have at least a dollar? He said, yeah, yeah, I got a, dad, a dollar. Yeah. He said, why? He said, he said, uh, give me that dollar. And so he pulled out his, his wallet. You know, he didn't have much money in it. He pulled out the dollar, gave my dad the dollar. My dad said, uh, here's the keys to this car. It's yours now. I'm going to sign the title over to you. And he said, you don't have to do that. He said, I know. He said, but I love you. And he said, I, I want you to be able to succeed and do what you need to do for your family. He said, but I couldn't give it to you because if you go home and your wife asks where you got this car from, it's going to seem like another man gave it to you. He said, so I had you give me a dollar so that you can go home and tell your wife that you bought a car. And he said, after that, he said, son, he said, this is empowerment. He said, I could have gave him the car, but it would have did nothing but stroke my ego. He said, but I had him pay for the car because I didn't want to take away from what it is in him already being a man providing for his family and said, so it didn't matter that he didn't pay a lot for the car. At least he paid for the car, paid, paid something, he right. paid something for it. Something. And so yes, it was my dad's way of showing sometimes you can empower people by not being so negative and pessimistic about what they already have. Yeah. They haven't gotten to the place that they need to be. Yeah, they haven't gotten to the place where they're this full, great, grandiloquent speaker or great leader, but don't take away what they already have. Accentuate the positive they have in them. Talk about the positive they have in them. Work to cultivating the things that they already have in them and, and watch them grow and blossom. And to this day, that man is saved. To this day, all of his young, all of his family is saved. To this day, all of his kids are saved. They all have college degrees, doing wonderful, just blessed, blessed family. But all that came from my father empowering him at the right time in his life. And so I say that to those that are watching. I don't care what people may say right now. You belong right here at this time during this season. God has put some things in you 
that can turn this whole world upside down. Sure, you don't have everything that you need. You might not feel like you have all the tools. You might not feel like you know enough, know the right people, but God can use the exact same thing that he's already placed in you if you just walk right now into your purpose, maximize your full potential, and, and go into the place where God wants you to be. I often say that winners don't become winners in reality until they become winners in mentality. You have to change the way you see things, change the way you see yourself, give yourself permission to grow, give yourself permission to fail, and give yourself permission to be the person that God has called you to be. And that's all I got to say. I just felt like I just needed to pour into somebody tonight. That's good stuff, man. And, and that's, that's great, Roger. That, that's that's profound, man. And, and you learn to see your father. He, the, the great thing about that is your father not only blessed, blessed that individual and, and allowed him to understand uh, empowerment, but, but he taught you at the same time. I was laughing because as soon as you start talking about that car and how excited you were, as soon as you start talking, I was like, he ain't gonna get that car. <laughs> Go get it. <laughs> uh -huh. I started laughing. I was like, Brian, get that car. <laughs> I didn't get it, but I'm gonna tell you, that's how powerful of a leader my dad was, that right. even through that, I wasn't mad. Right. I, I saw the big picture right. and the culture of our family that my parents cultivated was such a giving culture that even at 16, I got it because they had raised me to be a giver. They had empowered, you, right? they had empowered me yes, and had, had indoctrinated in my mind, it's more blessed to give than to receive. And so even though I didn't get right. that car, I knew that if my dad did this for a man that's not his son, uh, surely he's going to do something on down the line uh, to make sure that I'm all right. And so I, I was fine, man, and, and God just blessed abundantly and it has blessed my family and my parents tremendously because my parents, my dad will right now give you the shirt off his back. He'll, you know, it's countless people in the city right now that have businesses that are functioning businesses that my dad either gave them the money to start it, gave them the expertise to start it. He's, he's putting people through college, put them through school and all of this that he tells them. I, I, matter of fact, I had, a, I had a pastor in the Nashville area uh, tell me a couple months ago, said, said, Roger, I, I promised your dad I would never, and your dad and your mom that I would never say this. But when Nashville had flooding a couple years ago, we, our church lost everything. And your parents sent us an offering to get us back on track. Wow. And their only uh, justification for doing it, they said, you can't tell anybody that we did this because we're blessing you not to be seen. We're blessing you because we want to see the ministry go forth. And so she broke that truce with my parents just to tell me wow. just how blessed I am to have parents that are just such givers. And so I say that to anybody out there, you can literally give your way out of poverty. You can literally give your way out of circumstances, just being a blessing to the body of Christ, being a blessing to God's people without wanting to be seen, without having to be, stand up in the $100 line at the convention, uh, <laughs> just by just wanting to be a blessing to somebody and watch God begin to manifest things in your life just by you being a giver. Amen. On, on, on tonight, those that are out there, if something hasn't been said up to this point to launch you into the depth and the deepness of God, I don't know <laughs> what else can, right? And I hope and pray what we have shown thus far, we'll, we'll, we'll do about four or five more minutes. I hope what we have shown tonight is integrity, character, humility, love of the Lord, compassion of the Lord. You know, we're, we're, we're brothers, just like the last colloquy, we're brothers who love the Lord. We love him first. That's why we can all smile and laugh and get along so well, because yeah. that's what's in us. We've all have stories and what we went through, but what we went through, you don't see the damage of it now. You don't see the, the scars and the battles, but you know, we've been through something. Y'all that are watching, on the replay and live know that God has not forgotten you tonight. There's many that's dealing with difficult situations, seasons, circumstances. We know that, but there's nothing yet too hard for the Lord to do and work in and through you. 
We all got a gift. I don't care what that gift is. We're born with it. Now, we know it comes out of repentance and we know it, and we, we, we were born in sin, shape, and iniquity. We know all these scriptures. But what are you going to do to shift your life right now? Because whether or not you see it or not, your life is a testimony to the next individual that's looking at you. I'll never forget, prophetess, my wife, she preached some 20 some years ago a message and a little girl happened to be in service. 20 some years later, she sees this girl either in her salon or her store somewhere. She says, excuse me, ma'am, are you such and such? She said, well, yes, honey, I am. She said, I will never forget the place and the message that you preached when I was a little girl. She said, that right there shifted my life to want to, I said it to say, hopefully this tonight is something that's said and done by us here tonight that is shifting, that jumpstarts something in you because there's going to be atheists that watch this. There's going to be people that, that has this stench to, towards the Lord to say, you know what? Let me get off my seat and do nothing. Let me let me open these dusty hands up to open this dusty Bible up to want to do something. Let me let me give the heart service that's do him because I say this: if you still got breath, you still got time. Mm -hmm. You still got breath. You still got time. I was talking to uh, Pastor Cleveland Lynch a couple of weeks back, and he said this. I never forget this. He told me a story. He was a, a, a young preacher, and he was in the service. And a whole bunch of noise was going on in the service. And he goes like this and whispers to him to come here. And he says, the empty wagon makes a lot of noise. The empty wagon makes a lot of noise. Let me flip that. The gifts and the love, the compassion, the renewing, the depthness of God, Let's flip this. Put those in your spiritual wagon. Load it down. Load it down. Load it down with the gifts and the goodness of God. Because we're weighed down in oppression, depression, double-mindedness, the weight of the world, the, the, the lack or the debt or whatever these things that we might have in our mind is going on daily. It's a spiritual, there was a spiritual war going on. Mm -hmm. But we got to know that what it all, this is this, this should just be like a match. And just, the, you know, it's a match. Even if you don't see the fire, you know it because of the sound. The t -t -t and if the next thing you know, if you've been in the room and someone blows it out, you know by the smell. Mm -hmm. But if you're there when the light is, when the match is lit, you know it by the sight. Mm -hmm. So we're saying this tonight, that something tonight should ignite you, mm -hmm. should jumpstart you. Right. And, and, and what I want the people is doing now, share this, share this. Can we not be selfish tonight? Can we just not say this is just not for me? Can we just not say, uh, mm, I need to uh, 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 engulf this? No, let's share this because this is good teaching. This is good. Just real talk. This is good. Biblical talk. We ain't ask y'all for a dime. Hold on. Let me repeat myself. We ain't ask y'all for a dime. You ought to want to give and beg you for a half hour while you ought to give. We didn't do that tonight because we want to meet you where you are. Because you know what? Someone had to help us. We, we had to take the first step. For us to be students of the word, we got to study. We didn't get all this way just because of the goodness of our heart. And we, we just don't memorize. We live. You know, those folk that memorize but don't live a thing about the Bible? And can quote it, chapters and books I know folk that I went to school with that could quote for hours, but they had no intention. Let's flip it. Let's just not quote. This is not be this this uh, uh, audio book. Let's show because folks are looking at folks is looking at you. That's good. Folks is looking at you, and they waiting to see that if what you really live is going to show. Is, is going to show on the job, off the job, into something called our home, something called our family, something called our ministry, something called our local churches. And let me say this, just because 
one church hurt you, don't mean they all the same. Don't mean they all the same. Give God a chance. Give the church house another chance. Oh, that ministry didn't fit you. Try another. If you go to a shoe store, you don't stop at one shoe. You tell that person, can you go back? This don't fit too well. Can you go back and get me another shoe? Now, while you're getting the shoe, you find something that fits. Now, I'm not saying be church hopping now. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm, I'm saying be grounded and rooted. But I'm saying take the first time, take the first step. Give God a chance again. Those that have quit, because y'all, this is on my, this is just on my heart and my spirit that these folks are just stagnated. They're stagnated, but they looking and they listening. They looking and listening. If you're in the Charlotte area, anywhere, anywhere remotely, we'll drive an hour to go to a store, to go to a mall, to go to a concert, two hours sometimes, spend the money. So if you're in the Charlotte area, visit them. Visit them. If you're in Parkersburg, visit them. Chapmanville area, visit them. Find somewhere to go. Find somewhere to go. Again, that don't save you, but fail not to assemble yourselves. Fail not. If the church wasn't essential, he wouldn't have said, built my church. Yes, we know. I hear that too. That Well, back in those days, but we hear now. Like, like uh, Elder Green said, we hear now. We can't give account what happened 30, 40, 50 years ago. And we hear this. We ain't went because that happened to me 30 years ago. But you know what? If you go to one bad car dealership and they ripped you off 20 years ago and it's bought by a new dealership, you don't care what they did 20 years ago. You still going to buy the car. It's the car you want. It was the car. Give us want. another try. It's under new management. See, <laughs> and we go. Right? Right? <laughs> you know? And if under we new management. Walk, see, under new management. So on tonight, I pray this has been a blessing. We've been on about a, almost a little over an hour, probably hour, 20 minutes, hour, 30 minutes. And um, is there anything that's on you all's heart before we close out for the evening um, that you either want to just release or you just wanted to share real briefly? Um, and, and while you're doing that, you each can you each can pray as well. You can give what's on your heart and pray and pass the brown, pass uh, Elder Green, whichever one is to go first, what is going that, that uh, and you all close this out. I'll defer to my big brother. Bless you, man. Um, to my brothers, God bless you all, both of you all. I appreciate both of you all. And I certainly appreciate and, and I do not take our reports lightly. Uh, I would say to everyone that's uh, listening tonight to be encouraged and let's, let's push to literally take God at his word. And let's really understand that um, our, our victory and our outcome is not predicated upon what we can see or what we feel right now. It's predicated upon the word of God that he's spoken into our lives. And, and so uh, I would just say that let's be encouraged. Let's, let's get into the word of God. Let's press into God and, and, and let's seek him thoroughly. Let's seek him with our whole heart because God is doing something in this hour. And I really would just say, please, let's just be encouraged. Um, and, and so let's just pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you now, and, and God, we just give you glory, and we give you honor for the things that you've done. We thank you for the things that you're doing right now. We, are, we thank you even for where you allow us to uh, sit and stand even now, even if some situations are not favorable to us. We thank you for the experience. We thank you for the journey with you because... You allow us in the midst of these circumstances to know you just a little bit better. You, 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 you teach us how to increase. You give us faith and you give us favor. I thank you now for what you've done. Let your spirit move upon us. Sanctify your word in our hearts that we give you the glory and that we sin not against you, but that we increase to God. Yes. That we be witnesses of you. So, Father, you get the glory in our lives. We'll give you all the praise and the honor. The glory belongs to you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We pray you all have been blessed tonight. Um, as my big bro says, if you not, thank God. Anyhow. Yes. So, <laughs> but uh, please follow these two individuals. Bro is not too much on social media as much, but, <laughs> but please follow uh, Elder Roger Green Jr., uh, again, if you're in the Parkersburg area, please, 
show some love, go there, consider joining. If you're in the Charlotte area, please look them up, follow them. Um, all the information I will try to drop down below. Um, if not, you can go back, watch the replay, and they give all the information. This has been a blessing on tonight. I thank you all again for your time um, and just the camaraderie that we have. Uh, it's truly, uh, it's just humbling. It's just really humbling. Uh, this was a blessing to me. So uh, we love I everybody. Thank you, man. I want to uh, thank you. I, I would be remiss before we go without telling you, man, this is a God ordained platform that you have, man. Keep Amen. doing what you're doing. Uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to be on here with you and such great minds like you and Dr. Brown. And so uh, I just, I couldn't let it go without saying that, man. Keep doing what you're doing. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, again, Pastor Brown, it's an honor as well, sir. Thank you for kind of helping me spearhead, spearhead this thing here. So, um, but again, you all share this and hopefully uh, we'll maybe do this again sometime soon. Um, so thank you all once again. Have a blessed night. God bless everybody.